So, so we're happy to have uh, Professor Kaba Dipna from Northeastern University here talking about evolution of cooperation in structured competitions. All right, so uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I have to say a disclaimer that it's the first time I'm trying to give a talk on this topic. So um, we'll see how it goes. And please interrupt me if there are any questions or or if we notice other typos like I made on the date, I'm sure there will be plenty of them. So, first of all, I want to say that this is a joint work with a bunch of other people. Um, all of them are related to Harvard University in some way or the other. Um, uh, and and uh, Benjamin Allen is like the main author on this, uh, on this paper. So first I'll try to give a short introduction on what the problem is, why is, why is this an interesting model to study, that, and then I'm going to talk about the model in detail. Then in the, in the third part I'm going to go into a little, get, going to get a little technical and sort of explain the, how the, the analysis of these models lead to problems in random walks. And then I'll go into uh, explaining what our new results are, and, and maybe even at the end um, present some numerical the results of numerical experiments that we've carried out based on our, our theoretical results. So evolution, we, we all know what is evolution. There's a bunch of individuals all have some sort of genes, and then when they reproduce, then these change, these genes are slightly changed, and then the more successful genes are supposed to survive. And we're trying to build a mathematical model of this. So, first of all, this whole setup is going to work in many different contexts. So you can think of, of this as um, a population of uh, bacteria or a population of plants. Even uh, human tissue cells in human tissue um, tend to follow these kind of evolutionary processes on a small scale. But it can be also extended to uh, sort of social behavior of humans, economic decision making. And I'll try to bring a few examples where, this, where our results might have like, interesting uh, consequences on how we see society and such. So, the main driving forces behind evolution are mutation and selection. So mutation is the random change in the genes when re reproduction happens. And then selection means that uh, the more successful genes are more likely to reproduce and thereby eventually they are supposed to flood the population with their type. So, now, we want to build a model eventually that allows to capture genes that, that don't just affect your, say, physical abilities, like something that makes you bigger or stronger, but it also influences how you interact with others in the population. So that's what I call um, behavior. So maybe it should be like social behavior. And so this goes back to this. 70s, and uh, John Maynard Smith uh, realized that the language of game theory, so the classical economy game theory, is a, is a good way to capture this interaction between individuals governed by their genes. So in our model, individuals are going to interact with each other by playing games. and. Uh, we're going to measure the success of individuals based on the payoff they get from these games. So if I play my games more successfully, I get more money, say, and that, that's going to lead me to a, a better reproductive rate. And so unlike in classical game theory, we're not interested in finding the ideal strategy for a given game. What we're interested in is how the strategy is naturally evolved based on selection and mutation when 
then your genes are somehow responsible for what strategy you're using in these games. Okay, so the model actually is going to be a much, like, a very simplified version of this, but this is the main idea. And this whole field is called evolutionary game theory. All right, so in the end, what I want to focus on is cooperation. So cooperation is a kind of altruistic behavior where what I do affects me badly, but affects my friends or neighbors positively. And uh, such behaviors can actually be found in nature. I mean, there are like ants and other kinds of insects that that fully sacrifice their lives in just to help the the whole group as, um, survive, and they only care for the the offspring of other insects in the colony. But also in in the uh, in the more more evolved animals like in, in apes, you can see all kinds of uh, cooperative behavior from back scratching each other to to helping each other in many kinds of ways, and of course, humans are hopefully normally uh, fairly cooperative. So we see this kind of cooperation everywhere in nature, but just based on the original idea of Darwin, it's really hard to explain it, because if you look at natural selection acting on the individual, then there seems to be no motivation for an individual to behave in a cooperative way. They want to maximize their own benefit and not the benefit of others. So we have to look some, somehow one level higher and, and uh, at least on the level of a, a group selection to, uh, to explain this phenomenon. And there have been many ideas uh, in the past century trying to explain this. And one of the more successful ones is, uh, is based on the spatial structure of a population. And it turns out that if the cooperators are able to form clusters that are somehow shielded from the outside world, then their mutual benefits of helping each other can outweigh the um, sort of the bad effects coming from outside from the individuals that aren't helping them on the boundary. If these clusters are like, if you can form these clusters, that might explain why a group of cooperators can survive um, even in a hostile environment. Me. Yeah. How are you going to model this uh, cluster shielding? <laughs> so um, what we're going to do. So this 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 uh, statement about clusters is more like a philosophy, but. Uh, so we are going to, to model the structure of a population through a network. So we're going to, um, I'll go into details in a moment. Essentially, we're going to have a, fi have a fixed graph as, as our population. The nodes will be the individuals. And, uh, and there, if naturally, if you have a group of nodes that don't have that many uh, edges connecting them to the outside world then, then within themselves, that kind of you can think of as a cluster. Though, in our results, this will not necessarily show up, um, maybe only in a very indirect way. So, but I'll come back to this question. So, so this uh, con uh, kind of paradox between that individual selection and the cooperation, you're going to study that? Well, I'm going to, to introduce a model that allows to explain um, both hold at the same time. Well, I wouldn't say both hold. I would say, um, yes, so, so somehow the model is going to be absolutely objective. So the, 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 the probability of me reproducing is solely going to be based on my payoff. And if I'm cooperating, my payoff is going to decrease as opposed to if I were not cooperating. So in the sense, locally, at any moment, the, the cooperators seem to have a smaller chance of reproducing, yet the structure of the network might still promote the success of cooperators on, a, on, a, on, the, whole, on, the, on the level of the whole, whole population. So in a sense, yes, it's, a, it's an interesting contrast between the, that the individual success is decreased by cooperation, nevertheless, 
the success of the cooperating gene winning in this game in the long run is increased by the structure of the network from like totally random. And then, and then decrease of individual success is one thing, but then harm is something else. Like this altruistic behavior, does it matter for you? Like you see, you, you mentioned that some ants sacrifice themselves. So it might be that you, I mean, by cooperation, you decrease your chances of uh, reproducing. To zero. <laughs> but, uh, but it's different than the example where an ant actually, literally, individuals sacrifice themselves. Yeah, so maybe, I don't think our model can capture that. So it's okay. more like a soft version of... Uh, okay, so it is the soft version. Yeah, so I, I don't think we, we can go all the way to like... Nice. Like fully sacrificing yourself. Mm -hmm. So you still need to... So the idea is that... So in this model, the idea is that if, you, if both you and your neighbor are cooperating, then as a net, you have more resources than if both of you were not cooperating. Which doesn't happen if both of you sacrifice yourself for each other. That doesn't help much. Okay, so let me talk about the model. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to represent the population by a graph. We're going to denote the number of nodes by n. And this graph is going to represent interactions between individuals. So only individuals who are adjacent to each other are allowed to interact uh, in the population. So you can think of like a, a, a colony of a, like a, a tissue where the cells are the nodes and then adjacent cells would, would be uh, connected by an edge because I mean, me as a cell, we're not, never going to see someone who's far away, but I'm only going to sort of feel my neighbors physically. Or it could be a social network of, of humans where, where edge means friendship or like Facebook or whatever. All right, so, so each individual only interacts with adjacent ones. And then we allow the, uh, the edges to be weighted by a positive uh, or non-negative uh, weights, in fact. So this allows a more soft approach to the to modeling the population, it's not only like interaction or no interaction, but you can think of the edge weights as the strength of the interaction or the frequency of the interaction. The larger the weight, the more frequently those two individuals uh, interact. And then um, to these edge weights, I'm going to use the notation of the pij and, and pi i as the, the transition probability of the, the usual uh, random walk associated to a set of symmetric edge weights. And also the stationary distribution of this random walk is going to be denoted by pi i. This is just for later um, uh, to fix notation. So now we're going to, of course, simplify everything to almost the bare minimum. We're going to have two types of individuals, um, the so-called residents and the mutants, which they're equivalent, so there's, there's no difference, but the way we're going to think about it is that originally the, the whole population consists of residents, and then we're going to introduce one mutant randomly into the population, and we're going to measure what is the success of this mutation to spread in the population. But we're only dealing with two types right now, and, and uh, it's not clear whether this whole thing could be extended to uh, more elaborate forms of uh, I mean, the model can definitely be extended, but our analysis is not clear whether we can extend it to, uh, say, three types of individuals. All right, so now in any moment, we have the state of the population just given by um, a label of each node, whether we, we're going to label each node by zero if it's a resident and one if it's a mutant. So at any given moment, the state of the population is, given, is described by a function on the vertex set mapping to zero one. And, and so what does it mean, transition probability? Um, transition of what? Oh, that's, that, oh, sorry, so that's kind of out, like, um, so yeah, this line here, oops, what happened? This line here is, is not, doesn't really belong on this side, but this is the most convenient place to put it. So if you have, this is a math mathematical definition, if you have a, a graph with edge weights, then there's a natural way to, uh, to associate a simple random walk on this graph, uh -huh. where you move from nodes uh, randomly to, to a neighbor proportional to the edge weight. Uh -huh. 
So not not necessarily uniformly choosing among the neighbors, but and the um, distribution is also the some sort of what is that? So so if you start this random walk from anywhere and let it run for a long time, the, the distribution you're going to see, the, the, way, the probabilities that I'm going to be at any particular vertex converges to a stationary distribution. This is like standard Markov chain theory. And that's what we denote by pi i. And that's really proportional to the degree of the node. So uh, it's the degree divided by the total degree. And the pijs are just these local transition properties. But I agree this line doesn't really belong here. So we have residents and mutants. And in any particular point in time, we capture the state of the population by just knowing who is a mutant and who is a resident. So now we're going to look at a process that keeps updating the state. So we have one state, and then what's going to happen is somehow one of the individuals are going to die, and someone else is going to produce an offspring that's going to replace the, the dead in individual. And then, that way, you get to a new state. Right? So, um, so maybe here's a, a very simple graph. We have four nodes and five edges. And suppose uh, we have two residents and two mutants. And then a possible update is going to happen if this resident dies. And then one of its neighbors is going to produce an offspring and place it in, in the spot of the dead guy. So either the mutant is going to reproduce and then the new state, and, and put the offspring here, the new state that would be um, this. Whereas if, if this resident reproduces, then nothing changes. So because then this dead resident is replaced by a, a safe time. So these are going to be the, the changes to the state. And now there will be different ways of how we can actually play this game. I, I'll talk about at least two different variants, but there are many more. But in any case, the main component that, that actually makes this an interesting model is that to any individual, we're going to associate a number, this capital F, that tells you the fitness of that individual, which is some kind of measure of how successful the individual is at any given moment. So we'll talk about various ways how you can define this fitness. But when we do this updating, so when we do one step in the, in the, to, to get from one state to the next state, these, these fitness numbers are going to play a role in choosing the, the probabilities of who dies, who reproduces, and so on. So we're going to look at two different update rules. Well, I'm mainly going to talk about one, but there are, there are at least two natural variants people have studied. So first of all, the population structure is static, which is the, some kind of limitation of this model. The graph is given forever. It's not changing. And but it only, the only thing that is changing are the, are the state of the population. And in each step, someone dies and, some, and, and is replaced by a new individual, which is the offspring of one of the other uh, nodes. Now, the two different variants are called birth-death and death-birth. Um, so birth-death means that first you choose someone to, to produce an offspring. And you choose that proportionally to their fitness. So it's a random choice, but it's weighted according to the fitness of the individual. So individuals with higher fitness are more likely to produce this offspring. And then suppose that I chose this mutant to, or this resident to, uh, to, to, uh, to produce the offspring. Now this little resident is going to go and kill one of its neighbors and replace it. And at this point, the choice is, uniform, is, is uh, proportional to the, uh, to the edge rates. So this little guy is either going to choose to, uh, to kill this mutant, and then, and then we are in this new state, or it's going to decide to kill the other neighbor, and then we're back in the original state. So this is birth death updating again. So the rule is that first you choose someone to produce an offspring based on fitness, and then this offspring goes to one of the neighbors and replaces it. Excuse me. So yeah. at a given moment, you only choose one yes. node to reproduce. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll answer this question a little more detail a little later, but but essentially yes. 
but there's still two ways to think about it. But both in either way, you always have only one reproducing uh, person at the moment. So let's contrast this death birth, where instead of the the reproducing individual, first we choose who is dying. So suppose we choose this one to die, and then this is cho this is chosen uniformly randomly, and then one of its neighbors are chosen proportional to fitness and interaction frequency to produce an offspring and put it there. It doesn't seem like a big difference, and nevertheless, the two models behave quite differently in many cases. So, 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 so do, I was thinking how to calculate the fitness, so is it okay if somehow for M, I would not calculate zero fitness right now? Because there is an M next to it, which is a plus, so I will call that plus one, and then there's an R next to it, which is minus one, so one minus one is one. Yeah, so we're going to do a little more, calculate? it's going to be similar, the idea is going to be like that, but it's going to be a little more elaborate to capture this, uh, uh -huh. this interaction through cooperative games that they play with each other. R and M are, R and M in your... Are just the types. Are, are kind of enemies of each other. Right, well, in fact, um, the... Well, it's not like a conscious thing. Yeah, it's, I know, it's but more like to be able to do mathematics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, both both R and M tries to invade the whole population, or like M tries to invade the population which original was full of R's. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the death birth variant for most of the time. So, so any statement I make is about the death birth uh, uh, update rule. In the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about what can we do about birth death. It's similar but more complicated, so I'm, I'm focusing on that birth. All right, so um, now let's talk about the, the end of this game. So think of this as a game that's played on this board, so you always choose random, random nodes to die and then random neighbors to reproduce. When is this great game going to end? Well, it's a Markov chain, really, on the state space, and there are two two states that are, are permanent, or so-called absorbing states, the state when we have all residents or all mutants. And what we're going to be mostly interested in is you start up the, the whole process by placing one mutant, and then you're interested in the probability that at the end of the game you see all the only mutants and no residents. There are two outcomes. You either only see only residents or only see only mutants, and, of course, it's symmetric, so we're going to focus on the, on the probability of, of being absorbed in the, in the fully mutant state. So we start with a single mutant and want to find the probability that at the end of this process we have only mutants. That's kind of the chance of this pure mutation to win the game. But isn't it extremely low if everyone in the lattice is a... It is extremely low, right, sure. I mean, mutations don't happen in nature from day to day. So imagine that you have like a, a thousands of ants and one of them decides to mutate and grow a little antenna that helps them find food better. It's still very unlikely that it's going to become permanent. So it is very low. So we're never going to see high fixation probabilities. But what we're going to be able to compare is a fixation probability with selection and fixation probability without selection. So you could play the game where everybody has the same fitness, so there's like no difference between M's and R's, and then it's actually not hard to calculate that the, the probability that a single mutant overtakes the whole population is just one over N, one over the population size. And then uh, we're going to compare this as a baseline to how it changes if now we introduce uh, fitness and, and, and stuff like that. So, so we have the two absorbing states, all residents or all mutants, and the main question that we, we always want to answer is what is the probability of a single mutant overtaking the whole population? We call this the fixation probability. Um, now, the answer depends, it's going to depend on, the, on, the, on the how you place the initial mutant. And uh, it turns out that for many reasons, the best choice is to, to uniformly randomly place this initial mutant. It's, it's on one hand sort of biologically relevant, and also it makes the mathematical analysis uh, work. So it's a very convenient choice. Okay. 
So now, let me talk about the fitness, because that somehow gives the heart of the model. So um, first I want to talk about the simple variant that doesn't capture cooperation and behavior at all. This is called constant selection, and here the fitness of an individual only depends on its own type. So you can think of this mutation as being a little stronger than just the average mutation, or just the average resident. So then the fitness of, of uh, individual i is 1 if it's a resident, and some other number r if it's a mutant. And now the question is, how does the fixation probability depend on r? And already this question is, is highly non-trivial, and there are some surprising things that happen. So first of all, just re referring back to what I just said, if the two numbers are equal, so there's no effect of selection, everybody has the same fitness, then it's not hard to see that the fixation probability is 1 over n. It's a simple Markov chain argument. Now, what you want to see is you, you make r slightly bigger than 1. Is that going to actually increase or decrease the fixation probability? And it turns out it's not always what you think. There are graphs where increasing the fitness actually increases the fixation probability, but there are also graphs where, um, where um, it decreases the fixation probability. But the problem with this model is it doesn't really capture this cooperative behavior because fitness is static, it doesn't depend on my neighbors, it doesn't depend on how I interact with my neighbors. So um, instead of this basic model, we want to introduce a slightly more fancy model. Uh, uh, yeah. It, uh, go back to your previous slide. Is, is there any way to, to, to check if a graph is amplifier or suppressor? Um, no, there isn't a, a very simple. There isn't a very simple way of doing that. I mean, it should have, uh, have it should have had to do with the formula for the probability. Fixation yeah, but there there isn't like formula. a very general formula. But then, how do you even calculate? Rule? So you can calculate it for special graphs. Like people have calculated it for cycles, paths maybe lattices, but only for very special graphs. And then the other thing you can do, and what people have mostly done in this field, are numeric simulations, which means that you run the actual Markov chain on the huge state space a billion million times and just measure empirically what is the probability of, of fixating here and there. So you have like numerical evidence on certain graphs, how they behave. I have two, I'm sorry, but yeah. if I have two vertices with one edge, one R, one is one, then what's the fixation probability for the R? Well, what's the you, should, you should, that, that should, so for like complete graphs you can compute it, and I, I don't have it, it's, it's a, like one minus R to the N over something, I, I don't know it by heart, unfortunately. Um, okay. I, I can show you after the talk. So for like a graph where everybody is connected to everybody, which includes as a special case the, the edge, you can actually compute it. Um, yeah, I think I think I I, I wrote this incorrectly. Anyway, I'll, I'll I'll clear this up after the thought round. Okay, so um, so I want to talk about this more elaborate model for a moment where the fitness will also depend on what types my, my neighbors are, not only what type I'm, I am. Okay, so, uh, so now what, what the model is going to be like is that any pair of adjacent individuals constantly play games with each other. And uh, so we're going to have this two by two so-called payoff matrix, which tells you that if two residents pay, uh, play, like, okay, so, so the way you should read this is that I'm, I'm the column the individual. If I'm a resident and I play against a resident, then I get A amount of money. If I'm a resident and I play against a mutant, then I get B amount of money. 
If I'm a mutant and I play against a resident, then I get C amount of money. And if I'm a mutant and I play against a mutant, I get D amount of money. And they, these could be positive or negative numbers. And my partner gets, it's not, it's not a zero sum game. So my partner might get, according to the same table, a different amount than, than what I'm, I'm getting. So it's, it's not like we're paying each other. It's more like uh, some, some amount of, of resource we can collect from the environment or some kind of success. But any four numbers can define a game, and then these individuals are going to play these games on the graph. Okay? So now, this little fi is going to, some, some, it's going to be some kind of total payoff for any individual i, which means, imagine that it plays some games with each of its neighbors, and you just add up the, the, the total income it makes. And uh, the number of games it's going to play is going to be dependent on, the, on this interaction free strength. So the, the, the edge weights are going to determine how many games I am playing with each of my neighbors. So if I'm having a, a stronger relationship with one neighbor, then I'm playing more games with them. So my playoff from those games are going to pound a little more. And then I'm going to define my total fitness to be 1 plus delta times this total payoff. Um, now, the reason to, to do it this way is so that I can play with this parameter delta. Delta is going to be referred to as the selection strength. It measures how strong the effect of these uh, games are on my success. If delta is zero, then we're just back to the uniform, everybody has the same fitness case. And the higher the delta is, the stronger the effect of my payoff is on my own success. So this, the way this is set up is that you can use this delta as a sliding scale between no, no evolutionary benefit of being another type to a strong effect of my own type on my, my success. Uh, <clears throat> so how do you calculate delta? No, so delta is a parameter of the model. So both A, B, C, D and delta are parameters of the model. But like, how do you think of it as a parameter? Because somehow delta is the selection strength. So yeah, I've so already done the calculation to know if you are playing games with R or M. What are your no no no? So delta is kind of you. You should think of like slide as well. So. Um, I mean, you might be playing these games, and it may be possible that your reproductive rate depends only on what the outcome of these games are. And if you're, if you're doing well, then you get like three times as likely to reproduce. But if delta is small, that means that in the biological reality you're in, um, however good you play these games, you can maybe get like a 25% advantage over, over your peers. So somehow delta is like, a, you can think of as a constant in nature, which somehow depends on what type of species you're looking at, is how, really how much effect this specific, like this specific gene has on the success of the, the individual. And in reality, delta is pretty small. So I think like delta being like 0.0, .0 one zero point zero two is what has been measured biologically um, realistic. So, but can't we absorb delta into overall scaling of ABC? Um, no, because of the one. So it, it, you you think of this delta as a perturbation of one. You could absorb like if you're willing to change the one, then you can absorb it, but. So, so it's like there's a base fitness of one, and then there's some small effect of the of the games you're playing. Yeah, but we can absorb delta into the into f, right? Sure. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. We can absorb delta into uh, into ABC, but we don't we don't want to do that. <laughs> we eventually want to fix ABCD and then think of delta as really small. All right, so now we want to look at a particular type of game that's called the donation game, where 
there are two types, and now you label them C and D uh, in place, and actually I think of C as the mutant and D as the resident. C refers to cooperator and D refers to defector. And all that happens is if I'm a nice guy, I'm going to pay a cost of C to, make, to give you a benefit of B. So, so if I'm a cooperator and I play against the defector, then I just lose the cost that I paid and my, my part, my, my enemy gets the benefit. If we are both cooperators, then I pay the cost, but I also get the benefit from cooperating. And it's always understood that B is at least as big as C, otherwise this will never, never succeed. So, so this, only, this type of behavior is only going to be possibly successful if the benefit I'm giving to my partner is more than how much cost I'm incurring. Then at least a group of cooperators can flourish. And of course, if I'm a defector and I play against a cooperator, then I just reap the benefits without any cost. Okay. So now this is the formula that gives the payoff. So these SI, SJs are just zeros or ones, depending on whether I'm a, a cooperator or a defector. Uh, one represents cooperation and zero represents defection. So I, if I'm a cooperator, I just lose this, uh, this C. And then I get uh, benefits from my cooperative neighbors uh, proportional to the interaction strength. So the PIJs add up to 1, and then that's, that's why this is sort of a balanced expression. So if I'm a defector, then I do not incur the cost. I might still get the benefits. If I'm a cooperator, then I incur a fixed cost, and I might or might not get benefits from me. And this gives the payoff, and then the fitness is 1 plus delta times this. So now we only have three parameters, right? B, C, and delta. And we want to find the fixation probability of the, of the cooperative mutation. If I start with a, a graph of full of, of, of bad guys and place one cooperative guy, what is the probability that the cooperative gene is going to win? This is this row, row M. So this is the main question to understand it. Oh, sorry, this SI, small SI, is the total number of nodes that are connected? No, S, so, so we're, oh, the, so S is the state vector. So S is either zero or one on each node. So SI is zero if, if node I is a, uh, a defector and one if it's a cooperator. Uh, I'm a bit confused. Yeah, I'm sure because <laughs> so, so if that's I'm fine. Connected with multiple people. So yeah. I only donate once, or I donate. Uh, so for, you for you each. can think of this. I mean, you can also write this same formula as the sum for all of my neighbors, um, P I J times uh, uh, what is it? B times S J minus C times S I. So you can write it in this Laplace, uh, it's a little bit like a Laplace operator type thing. So the, the PIJs add up to 1, so this is the same formula as there, except you move the Cs outside. And now you can think of it as, I donate C and I maybe get a benefit B for each of my neighbors. So because the PIJs add up to 1, it's like my time is shared among my neighbors in some proportion. I can think of it as incurring a fixed cost C and then getting some portions of the benefit B from all my neighbors. Or I can think of it as paying a little cost for each of my friends or enemies and getting some benefit. But it's the same thing. So PIJ is the transition probability. Is the transition probability based on the interaction strength. Great. So. Um, and one, one very nice. The question is, these models are not for conscious species, right? Right, so there's a totally different uh, field of research when it more like studies like repeated games. So when two players play the same game over and over again, and based on the behavior of others, yeah. it, it changes the behavior. No, this is for behaviors that are governed by your genes and not by your, your thinking. So you can only change behavior if you die and someone else replaces you.
or it could be some kind of spreading of, uh, of like an idea, like political viewpoints. Uh, but you're not going to change your political viewpoint from one day to the other just because you no, someone I mean, beat you up. It's more like it's a slow process. I mean, if you're conscious, even then you won't really change your really, political viewpoint. Have examples of it. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> so, uh, so it, this this model does neatly capture some kind of like deeply held positions which are changing seldomly only if like once in a while you, you wake up you know once in two years you wake up and oh I should refresh my opinion and then and then you go ask your friends and then if more friends have are liberal liberals and you're more likely to become a liberal but you don't change your your this kind of opinion too often right so I'm gonna skip the next slide because this is really uh, unnecessary and uh, I want to go a little bit over how the analysis of this uh, thing happens. So first of all, I, want, I mentioned that computing this, this fixation probability is the most important question, but it turns out that it, for general values of BC and delta, it's NP hard. So it's very hopeless for large, large population sizes. So what people have been studying instead is what is called weak selection which is kind of looking at the first order expansion for a small delta. So you can really assume that delta is small, it's biologically fairly relevant, so many, many actual species operate in very small delta. And so now we're only going to worry about the, the small delta limit. Okay, so when delta is zero, then you get that the fixation probability is one over n. And then, for a small but non-zero delta, you can write the fixation probability as a Taylor series in delta, or like a first order expansion. What happened? So, so the, the fixation probability is the, this one over n, which comes from the delta equals zero case, plus a linear term in delta, plus everything that's higher order I'm going to ignore because we're thinking of delta as small. And now the goal is to compute this coefficient q, and in particular to decide whether it's positive or negative. So what does a positive q mean? It means that um, the chance of a, cooperate, a co cooperator surviving or overtaking the population is more than if everything would be just happening randomly. Right? Delta equals zero corresponds to a, a random process. It's also called a neutral drift. Then, then mutations don't have any effect on your, on your success, they're just drifting randomly. Um, and compared to that, if, if we have a positive Q, that means that uh, being a cooperator is actually helpful in concurring the whole population. So the goal is to decide, is to compute this coefficient and decide when it's positive and when it's negative, to understand what, stru what network structure promotes cooperation and what not network structure hinders cooperation. Um, so the main idea is to look at this funky uh, quantity I denote by S hat, which is just sort of the degree weighted count of cooperators in, this, in the world. So at any moment, I, can, I don't just want to count how many cooperators there are, I just want to count them weighted by the stationary probability distribution, which is essentially a degree weighted count. Now, it turns out that this quantity is, so now you can look at the process and see how it changes over time. So I'm just looking at any, moment, any time moment, how this weighted average, of weighted count of cooperators changes. And if delta is zero, this turns out to be a martingale which is why it's a good thing to study. And then for small values of delta, we can kind of use a martingale perturbation argument to get the asymptotics of this count for small delta. Now, I want to emphasize that this count actually captures the, the fixation probability, because if you look at the expected value of this S, once you're in an absorbing state, it's either all cooperators, then this S is going to be one, this S hat is going to be one, 
And if, uh, if you're all in all the factors, then it's going to be zero. So as t goes to infinity, this quantity s hat goes to either zero or one. Its expectation goes exactly to the probability that you get absorbed in the, in the, uh, the, the, mu the all mutation state. So the fixation probability is the limit of the expected value of this s hat. And then what you can do now is for at any given large time, you can write it as an integral of its derivative. You can take the derivative inside, and then what you get here, okay, so this is probably a little too technical, but anyway. So what you get here is you express the fixation probability, and the subscript S0 means that now I'm starting from an arbitrary state S0, not necessarily from a single mutant. So I'm starting from an arbitrary state, and I want to understand the fixation probability. It's equal to the, to the average number of, uh, of cooperators in the starting state, plus this infinite integral of the expected value of the, the momentary change of my number of cooperators. Now, the good thing about this, this blue part, this momentary change of the number of cooperators, is because that only depends on what state you're in right now and doesn't really depend on how you got there or how far you're ahead in time. So this d over dts, s hat, it only depends on the current state. So we introduce a notation for it. And then you can work and find the first order expansion of this differential in delta. So first of all, delta equals zero. It's a martingale means that the derivative is then zero. The, the expected value doesn't change. Right? This ds somehow um, captures the change of the expected value. But if you're a martingale, the expected value doesn't change, so it's zero. And then the first order expansion looks something like this. And now this d prime is the quantity you want to measure. And you can sit down and work out how this d prime quantity depends on the model parameters. So it's only going to depend on the b and the c. And it's going to depend in a fairly intricate way. So I don't really want to go into the meaning of this formula. It doesn't really have a, a well, I'm going to say something about the meaning a little later. But what you have to see is that this quantity only depends on the current state and also on the, on the numbers b and c. And then these si superscript 0, 1, 2, 3 are just some kind of uh, shorthands for, for complicated averages. So this is a really complicated formula. Uh, it's what it is, but you can actually compute it. And delta disappeared, right? Because we're looking at a first order expansion. So this is the multiplier of delta in this first order expansion. All right, and, and then you have to evaluate this infinite integral of expectations of this previous formula. And what it turns into is for fixed states i and j, you have to evaluate the expected value of the product of si and sj. So this means the product of, uh, so si is 1 if, if i is a cooperator and 0 if it's a, a, a defector. So si times sj is essentially either 0 or 1, depending on are, are both cooperating or not. And this is the kind of quantity you want to evaluate. Unfortunately, this doesn't convert, so you actually have to sort of perturb it slightly to make it a, a convergent integral, and then you can evaluate it. And this is where it starts to get interesting, so I'm sorry about it. It's probably too technical here until now. But now I want to a little, little bit explain the main idea of how this can be evaluated by looking at random walks on the graph. So essentially, you have the graph, and you have two nodes, i and j. And you want to know if they're the same type or not. At any given time t, you want to decide whether i and j are the same type. Now, during this process, what kind of things happen? Everything that happens is that someone kind of infects its neighbor. So if my type changes, the change came from the type of my neighbor. So you can trace back the ancestry of this node, and you can trace back the ancestry of this node. Suppose the last time I died and was replaced, 
it was replaced from this node i prime, and then maybe at some point this node was replaced from, from this other node j prime, meaning now j carries the type of what j prime had. And then you're kind, kind of tracing these ancestries backwards, and if at some point they met, that they had a common ancestor, then they have the same type. That's a guarantee that they have the same type. And in fact, if you start from a single mutant, the only way they both can be mutant is if they met, if their ancestries met. Because there was a single original mutant. To have both of these mutants, their ancestries must have met before time t. And this leads through a, a number of steps to actually having to understand the expected time these ancestries meet. So the, the important quantity that comes out of this calculation is that for any two nodes, you start two kind of random walks going back, tracing the ancestries of these nodes. And you want to measure how back you have to go in time until they meet. And you want to actually eventually measure the expected time it took them to meet. And uh, so this is sort of becomes the main quantity is tau ij is the expected number of, uh, the expected time uh, that has to pass before these two ancestries meet. And then this mysterious integral I was curious about is actually captures exactly this meeting time. Now the meeting times satisfy a very nice simple uh, recurrence relation that allows uh, to fairly efficiently compute them. I'm saying fairly efficiently because it's still an n squared uh, size matrix. So this is a linear equation in n squared variables. But it's a very nice, typically sparse matrix. It's diagonally dominant. So there are very effective methods of solving this system that allows you to numerically precisely compute these tau ij's. Um, by thinking of this problem as sort of a boundary, pro a boundary value problem on the product graph, graph G cross G. And once you've computed these tau ij's, then there's a very simple formula expressing the fixation probability in the first order expansion using these meeting times. So this tau 1, tau 2, and tau 3 are some simple formulas derived from, from the meeting times. So essentially what we can prove for a very general weighted graph is that you can, in the, in the limit of weak selection, you can express the fixation probability using only the knowledge of these meeting times on the graph. Now what this allows is a huge speed up in, in numerically computing these, uh, these quantities. Because until now, the only, essentially only available way was to run simulations on a 2 to the n state Markov chain. And even on a graph of size like 100, this took days to get a reasonably, uh, a reasonably accurate result. While for a graph of size 100, this takes like less than one second to compute now. And, and even on, on uh, graphs of size of the thousands, we can compute these in a reasonable amount of time. And it doesn't scale very badly, so it scales more or less quadratically in the time it takes to, uh, to compute these quantities. It's, it's like n squared times log n or log n squared or something. Now, if you want to answer when is this probability bigger than just 1 over n, then you can just look at the blue quantity and see when the blue quantity is positive, and you get to this condition. So it turns out that if you fix the graph, but you don't fix the B and the C numbers in the game, then whether the graph is going to help the cooperators depends only on the benefit-cost ratio. And the benefit-cost ratio has to, um, has to be bigger than this one particular quotient that's when the, the benefit is high enough so that the graph starts helping the cooperator. But is this quotient always positive? No, it's not always positive. So there are graphs, in fact, like 
many graphs, I think around half of, of all random graphs we've tested, where this quotient is negative, which means that however big benefit the cooperation provides, it's never going to be more successful than just random uh, mutation. But there are graphs, there are many graphs for which this is, is indeed positive. So, and then if the benefit is big enough, then the cooperators are going to be successful. Is it possible that I and J have the multiple common ancestors? Um, well, I mean, they have a first common ancestor, and then from there on, if you keep going back, they, they have a, a whole lineage of common ancestors. Th this is the only way that it can happen. And then uh, for those lattices where all, for every vertex is connected to every other point in the lattice, how do you find the... So for special graphs, you can compute these, uh, these meeting times. It's not easy, but for like special types like complete graphs or lattices, you can, you can sit down and work them out by hand. But for a general graph, the, only, the best thing we can do right now is, uh, is just use linear, like solve the linear system in a computer. Now, we're really hoping that, so these, these meeting times is a very mysterious quantity, and it has been somewhat studied, but it's not very well understood. We're really hoping to get some like, structural understanding on how the, how the network um, controls these uh, meeting times, how the meeting times depend on the network, and then maybe we can say more quantity, like more uh, statements like, oh, if the network is like this, then it's likely to, to promote cooperation. If it's not, then it's not likely. One such thing is uh, as a, the Cheeger constant or spectral gap that we know um, actually, like if, if, the, if the graph has a high spectral gap, it is going to promote cooperation somewhat. So can you also explain like when you choose eventually this path, like you might have several many ways of getting to this common ancestor. So, so I, I didn't get to the point where you said... No, no, so the, the thing is that you, you're playing this Markov chain on the state, state space. So people are dying and, and born. So suppose you took like a million steps. And now you look at these two nodes. Yeah. Now tracing the ancestry back is unique as well. It's, it's like you have no choice. This, the last time this was replaced, was replaced, say, by this guy. And then you only, all you have is to move here. So if you saw how the Markov chain progressed for a million steps, then you can trace the, the ancestors back to a million steps uniquely. But now I just show you this state, and I don't show you how, how the Markov chain got there. Then the possible ancestries are like random box on the graph. I see. So I thought uh, you could argue that I with a given probability could come from I prime, but with a different probability could come from some other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you don't, if you haven't seen the process in time forward, but until you got to this moment, you don't really know where this came from. It might yeah, that's have come means. from, and that's why it's sort of the, all, all the possible ancestries are, are like random world trajectories, and that's why you want to understand the expected time it takes for two of these random trajectories to meet, and that's this how I J is that's come up. So, and then if, if, this, if this quotient is negative, then actually it also has a biological meaning. That means that sort of spiteful behaviors are promoted, that when I pay a cost to harm you and not to benefit you, that kind of behavior can also be promoted by a network structure if this tau 2 over tau 3 over minus tau 1 is negative. Uh, now, for regular graphs, these results were known, and, but, but our theory somehow recovers those results and even generalizes them. And if you have a k-regular graph, then this last big expression exactly computes this quotient. So n minus 2 over n over k minus 2, which for large, large n is roughly k. And this has been referred to as the bc over k, uh, b over c plus k rule. So if you have a k-regular network, it turns out that this critical ratio is, is almost always close to k. So the benefit has to be k times as big as the cost for cooperation to be favored. But even by, 
by Hamilton, it was conjectured that this is kind of true in general, but now our results show that this is not, this is not at all true in general. We found graphs which are very far from, very, this, ratio, this, this critical ratio is very far from the average degree. Um, now, I think this, this maybe, uh, I'll finish with this slide because this is a very cute, uh, a cute observation. So let me scroll back to this formula on the top. So um, this is another way through our results to express the critical B over C ratio, so how much bigger B has to be. Tau I I's are meeting times started from the same vertex. Pi I is just the, the stationary distribution. And this Pi is the two step, is the probability that the random walk returns to I in two steps. So it's, I, I start from I, I take one step, I take another step. What is the probability that I came back? Now, the question is, what, is, what are the graphs for which this is as small as possible? It, to, it turns out this B over C stars always at least one, and there are graphs where it's very close to one, but they are only weighted graphs. Weighted graphs where the red edges form a matching and have a huge weight compared to other edges. These graphs will have critical B over C ratio very close to one. As you can see on these graphs, the limit of these curves are somehow, you know, on this graphs, the limit of these curves is always one, which means that for a large number of, uh, for a large value of the way the critical BC ratio converges to one, which means that society where pairwise ties are very strong promotes cooperation the most. So this kind of explains why we want to live in, in, in like marriages as couples, for example. It's a, I think that's a very neat interpretation of this result, that, that cooperation in, in, uh, at home is somehow what is the most beneficial. And it's mathematically rigorously derived, well, just a rather simplified model, I, I agree with that. Another interesting example, oops, this last graph down here, which is the first example we found where the critical B over C ratio actually is less than the average degree. All the other examples that are known, this critical ratio is bigger than the average degree. Here you can beat the average degree. The average degree is two, and the critical B, B, B over C ratio is roughly 1.5. 1, 1 this structure is a large connected graph, like a large clique, with everyone having a bunch of leaves on it, like little spiders. So this to me like, looks like very much like some kind of corporate structure where you have like a group of executives and then each of them has like a small team under them. And this is another structure that heavily promotes cooperation, surprisingly. All right, so I'll stop here because I kind of have time. Thank you very much for your attention. And questions, I'll answer them. Some questions? Do you, just curious, it might be irrelevant completely to what you do, but do you consider ever homology of these random graphs? Well, the answer is no, but the answer is that, the other answer is that it's probably not far-fetched. The, the way this whole project started is we wanted to understand whether our previous work on curvature of graphs can be applied to say something about these meeting times. And I right. you still haven't looked into them. I tell you which path is eventually to. They are homologous to each other. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it is possibly a, a, a very good insight to look at the, somehow the cycle structure of the graph. Unfortunately, we understand very little about these, uh, these random walk meeting times. And uh, so I can't really say if this is going to have any viability, but this is certainly something that, that uh, would be worth looking at. And any kind of idea of how to understand these meeting times would be great. Um, and again, I, I, I really wanted two years or three years ago or two years ago to, uh, to try to use curvature techniques to, uh, to bound these because these, are, these feel like you could do them but we never actually got there, and then they sort of went in a different direction. So, so in your 
one of the one of the examples you mentioned that uh, you know family to to uh, family model is 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 promoting the culture. I mean, uh, how does this thing? Uh, how does B critical ratio B over C change when you include change the nodes of from two to three and four? Um, that's that's a good thing we haven't looked at it. So you mean like like having four things connected strongly and then uh, and then another four things? Yeah. So I think it would certainly make it worse, but might still be like in the large. Like if you take a limit of the way being large, it would still be reasonably bounded. So the, the main problem is this critical B over C ratio does tend to behave like the average degree in many cases. So if you have like 50 friends, like everybody has 50 friends, then this critical B over C ratio is already too big. You would have to get like a 50 times payoff on any cooperation, which never happens in nature. So. So you either need to find places where there are only few number of edges, or when a small number of, like, you might have many connections, but a few of them should have, like, a large weight compared to the others. That, that still makes it possible for this ratio to remain reasonably small. Like, if you have these cliques of four, then I think, like, it wouldn't, like, blow up the, the B over C ratio as the population size grows. Because that's one problem. If, if the structure of the population remains, but the size grows, if the, the B over C ratio blows up, then that means that it's really hopeless for this type of network to promote cooperation in the model. But like having these small, heavy clicks is, is one way to prevent that, for sure. And what happens if you do it the other way around? If everybody is a co cooperator and you're the mutant is the, the it's, it yeah. turns out to be symmetric. So so um, whatever formulas you get, at least in this first order approximation for fixation probabilities from a single mutant, you get exactly the corresponding formula for a single defector. Okay. So it's it, the roles are essentially symmetric. More questions? Uh, if not, let's thank Gobble again. It's going to get worse. The bigger the families, the somehow the worse the. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. So I guess that's a uh, mathematical support for the current power. Well, mm, yeah. how do the suppressor graphs look like? But 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 that's that's a big fear. I mean, you 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 the the you you look at particles. Yeah, I mean, this is this model is clearly not going to explain everything. <laughs> I'm sure about that. And there are many other facts. And it's yeah. But maybe like so we we analyzed we have like real data from networks of zebras or something that are known to be like social animals. And it turns out that if you look at the data, it's a it's a big graph with a lot of edges, but only a few like there are it's it's a weighted graph and, and the weights are are really concentrated only on a few edges. So they live in a big pack, but only like everyone only interacts with a few others all inside inside the group. What's the what's the average uh, If you didn't look at the, the frequency of the interaction, then everybody would interact with like 
15 other zebras, but if you look at, at the strength of the interaction, then you can limit it down to four other zebras. So that was, I'm just randomly saying numbers, but this was the kind of the proportion. So if you want to cooperate, then you just have to interact with as few as possible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> essentially, essentially that's still true that the average degree is somehow related to the uh, I mean, if you believe that uh, somehow it's, it's described by this donation type of payoff matrix, maybe the payoff matrix is different. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not quite clear. Like, your, your, your research. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>